Hello, I'm Amit Sethi. I'm will be talking about cancer image analysis using AI, uh, and I will be talking about both opportunities and challenges of uh, this topic. Uh, so here's the outline. I will talk about hierarchy of task in AI, and then I will go a little bit into what is AI, challenges to AI, what causes AI to fail, and uh, the entire AI life cycle, not just the training and testing, but the entire life cycle, and how AI can help doctors and how doctors can help AI. So uh, AI uh, can enable a series of tasks, a hierarchy of tasks, and I'm going here roughly from the easier to the more difficult one. So the, the lowest order of task here is to de delineate anatomical structures. So let's say you have a radiograph and let's say this is the ventricle of the heart. Then the AI can delineate it so that you can do measurements on it very easily or automatically do measurements. The second task that it can do, uh, which is slightly more complicated for AI, is to mimic experts when they are doing simple diagnostic tasks. So, for example, if we look at a chest X-ray, whether it is a normal chest X-ray versus a chest X-ray with suspected pneumonia. Then, uh, slightly more complicated task would be relating structures and patterns that you see in a medical image to the underlying disease state. Here, what I mean by underlying disease state is something that is not very obvious directly when you look at the image. And this could be because uh, you know the underlying disease uh, stage because of a molecular test. So if you look at a, uh, an MRI of a tumor, then based on slight changes in the appearance of the MRI, some subtle changes which are not perceptible to humans, but they are there in the digital form, can we detect whether it has EGFR positive mutation, whether it is EGFR positive or whether it is wild type. So that is one more uh, way of looking at uh, uh, structuring an AI task. Uh, then slightly more complex than that is uh, predicting the treatment outcome. So for example, if you are looking at two tumors that are uh, from a diagnostic point of view the same, then which of these is going to be uh, is likely to survive and which is not likely to survive uh, for a given treatment. So based on that, if we have such models for multiple treatments, we can plan treatments better. So that is slightly more complicated. And then uh, for modern AI, the structure of the of the AI engine is so diff uh, so complex that actually building explainable logic is one of the most difficult tasks in AI and it has not been fully cracked yet. Although doing all the other tasks that you see above, those are easier for AI. So here's another view of the same idea that on the left hand side you have the downstream information and on the, uh, on the right hand side you have the upstream information. So what I mean by that is that uh, when you uh, uh, encounter a patient, uh, we first uh, see their clinical data, we see their imaging data, but then after that we can, uh, we might want to order their molecular test and then after that we might want to give a diagnosis and then we will prescribe a treatment plan and after that uh, the treatment will be successful or not successful or whether there will be relapse or no relapse and so forth. So uh, these are color coded in a particular way because these this is the diagnostic information this is the planning and or the o opinion part of it and this is the factual but it comes longitudinally later so anything that you see on the left hand side can be used to predict what is on the right hand side uh, to build a useful ai model so what i mean by that based on clinical data can we predict the doctor's behavior about what will be the diagnosis based on clinical data can we predict what will be the doctor's treatment plan by looking at several treatment plans that we have collected over the past, let's say, few years. Then looking at uh, clinical data and molecular data, can we predict survival of the patient based on, uh, uh, based on the treatment plan that will be in between? Okay. Uh, then we can even add imaging data in between. So looking at clinical data, imaging data uh, together uh, can we predict the diagnosis? Can we predict the treatment plan? Can we predict the outcome? So we can even take just a single modality here and predict something on the right hand side. So what is AI or ML? Basically it is about 
uh, automating the use of related data to estimate models that make useful predictions about the data and the model should uh, the model is uh, structured in such a way that given more data we can improve the model uh, we should be able to improve the model so there is a sweet spot for machine learning which is uh, perhaps a more technically correct term for artificial intelligence it it works well when we have lots of structured data so here there are two operative words one is lots the other is structured so it doesn't work well with unstructured data and it doesn't work well with uh, fewer data okay and the model that usually uh, machine learning learns is uh, becomes very complicated i will show you what that means in a min uh, in a minute uh, so if explainability is crucial then we probably do not want to go to machine learning most of the useful ml models are not explainable then prediction accuracy is the primary goal so if you want to make complex predictions then ml is good but don't expect explainability and the underlying model is complex but stationary stationary means it doesn't change over time so uh, an example of a non stationary model would be that let's say we are trying to recognize the age of the person by looking at clothing but the clothing changes with fashions of the times however the underlying biology of how tissues look in different kinds of medical images that does not change over time uh, depending on what disease state we are looking at so there are two phases of uh, uh, machine learning model training and deployment so during the training uh, phase we are looking at the past data that we have collected so there are two crucial elements of it one is the input which is let's say the raw image and the other is the label which means what is the disease state or the annotation that is made on the disease state and with these two the machine learning process will give us a model now this model we will use at test time along with new input so that it can give the labels that we would have given if it was done by an expert and in some cases it would give the label that another modality or longitudinal follow up would have given okay so when it gives the label beyond just what a human diagnosis would be that would be a more difficult task for ai but that can be done so inside the ai what it is it is basically just a formula so for example if you want to predict the the height of a person we would plug in the age into a formula and in the formula we have couple of unknowns a b and c and once we plug in the the age we should be able to get a good estimate of the height and within plus minus uh, some tolerance and that is basically what ai is in ai what what we do is we automate the process of finding these unknown coefficients or the unknown weights the a b and c weights so these are estimated using data uh, for simple formulas like what you see on the screen uh you can uh, estimate it using statistical models in ai instead of these three three weights we will call it three weights and one input one input so this is this is fine for statistical models but then it becomes uh, quite uh, uh, it doesn't do uh, many useful predictions for useful predictions we may have for example 1 million inputs and we may have 10 million unknown weights so what are these uh, inputs and uh, and weights so for example if you are looking at that 1000 by 1000 picture okay which could be a radiograph so let's say if it is 1000 by 1000 then there are 1 million pixels in this image and those are the 1 million inputs and 10 million are the weights of a neural network uh, which are inside that ai model or 10 million parameters so consequently to estimate these 10 million weights we need lot of data and lot of processing power so that processing power that is now being provide, provided by gpus and the large amount of data is basically what hospital repository data are okay or like tcga tcia kind of data so this machine learning is trying to find complex associations here's an example from uh, hypothetical example from pathology so basically let's say if we have two variables that we extract from the data radius of nuclei and size of the gland then based on that it is trying to find these boundaries that will uh, change the that will find the uh, 
decision boundary between good outcome and and bad outcome in five years so what that means is it is now it can now be predict predictive of these outcomes in the future when we can extract this data uh, there are different kinds of data that are more amenable for use of machine learning an example would be the simplest type of structured data and we need structured data for machine learning we cannot have unstructured data in structured data the simplest one is kind of records where we have one column for different attributes in a record and one row for different patients or different subjects or data points so for example this could be survival we are trying to predict survival so the first column could be survival in months and then the next several columns could be for example gene expressions for different types of genes so that is the most basic type of data however this data is not what is uh, currently associated with the revolution in ai revolution in ai is not for this simple kind of record structures the revolution in ai specifically uses specific uh, some kind of machine learning models that are called deep neural networks and they work when we have either spatial order or temporal order so what i mean by spatial or temporal order is if you look at an image and if you blow up and look at some uh, 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 you look at the pixels closely there is a spatial correlation we know that something to the up or down of a particular pixel will have a particular pattern to make a particular shape or a particular texture or a pattern so that order of pixels is very important whereas here in the column data if i swap these two if i swap these two columns uh, then it doesn't really matter but i cannot swap pixel locations those pixels fall in a particular manner and that's why they have some meaning similarly with audio data where the pressure wave point the pressure wave sample at one point and another point they have to be up, they have to appear in that particular order so these deep neural network exploit the structure of the data quite well in a hierarchical manner a more complex data is uh, if the data is related in some sort of a graph so graph means that there is a, a web of relationships uh, we will skip that for now so basically what these deep neural networks is doing is the following so first let's talk about a shallow neural network and before that let's talk about a single neuron so single neuron is nothing but some of you may be familiar with linear regression or or logistic regression you have three different inputs right and we multiply them each with their own weight and add some bias and throw it into a function and we get an output this is the simplest kind of a uh, model that you have in logistic regression or linear regression and when we train it we have the desired output and the computed output we uh, compare them together and uh, find what is the error in that and based on the error we send a signal back that is used to adjust the weights now we can have multiple outputs now things get interesting when we start to add layers of neurons so instead of having just these two output neurons we add a layer in between and what this layer does is it extracts some features from the inputs and then the simple logistic or linear regression is computed on top of the extracted features where these weights as well as these weights all arrows have weights they are trained uh, uh, simultaneously now if we keep adding more and more layers to the neural network it uh, doesn't uh, after some time it stops uh, being useful to us because uh, we will we have too many so the number of arrows that you see the blue arrows that is the number of weights those keep increasing and uh, because of that there are too many parameters or too many weights to be learned and because of that we have something called gradient dilution so enter convolutional neural networks they exploit the idea that if you are looking at pixels right so let's say this is the top pixel the pixel below that pixel below that pixel below that and pixel below that and their index cannot be permuted because they have a structure i cannot swap the the pixel order uh for these kind of uh, data points we only need to have let's say a set of weights and we can repeat the same set of weights in a different location and we can repeat in another third location without having to introduce new weights so the same weights are used again and again at different locations so what that means is that if you are trying to detect an anatomical structure it can be slightly up slightly down or slightly below right you don't need a new feature detector for that you can reuse some of the parameters to detect the same structure or same repeating structures in different parts of the image 
because of that uh, there is uh, there is a restriction in how these uh, the architecture of the neural networks which has helped us uh, revolutionize and increase the number of layers and uh, uh, work with the kind of data data that we we can get so because of that the progress in ai has been remarkable in the sense that if you look at it there a there were used to be a yearly competition to recognize 1000 different types of objects in about 1 million and later on it increased to 20 million images so in 20 million images and 1k categories right so what is a category so for example a particular breed of dog is one category a, a car is one category a truck is one category ship is one category etc these are all consumer photography images so how how much can we detect how uh, how accurately can we detect the uh, the image that is presented in uh, in one of these thousand categories so uh, if you just have a random guess then your uh, accuracy is going to be 0.1 percent because uh, you have one in a thousand chance of getting it correct and then the metric that is tracked is that if you if we uh, rank order the guest categories then the correct category should be in the top five categories that's called top five error and human accuracy was around 3.5 percent so why human accuracy or uh, sorry the human error rate was 3.5 percent uh, why it is not 0% is because some images are slightly ambiguous. Uh, for example, the view of the dog could be from the top. So from the top, it might look like a goat. Um, and because of that, the accuracy is not completely uh, 0% or uh, sorry, the, uh, the error rate is not 0%. And uh, because the humans who collected the data, they consulted with each other. So a committee of experts is always better than a single human. Uh, so uh, this error rate is not 0%. So in around 2015, uh, so these are the neural networks whose accuracy kept increasing or the error rates kept decreasing. In around 2015, it surpassed human accuracy and now it is slightly above human accuracy. The size of the bubble is how large is the neural network, how many unknown weights are there in the neural network. So it started with 62 million, 138 million, then someone came with uh, more ingenious uh, ways of specifying the layer structure of the neural network and then it went down to 5 million again started bloating and then again came down to 25 million so what kind of things can can we use it for in medical diagnosis uh, so example would be we could start with something as simple as diagnosis so this is basically replicating what a human expert does whether looking at an image so if we have cases and controls whether the image is malignant or benign or uh, whether it is uh, grade 3 versus grade 1 or 2 i'm showing a, a pathology example but it is equally applicable to radiology then uh, whether it is uh, we can make it even more complicated whether it's ductal carcinoma or in situ carcinoma we can uh, try to predict the the result of us of a, of another test by looking at this image which a human expert may not be able to do but the subtle signs of that test are actually visible in the image are there in the image but they are not like um, easy for a human diagnosis uh, diagnose uh, human vision to to actually identify but they are still there so that would be for example finding mutations egfr positive mutations versus wild type slightly more value added test or an even more complicated test would be to so let's say we are looking at uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy, whether this person is a respondent or a non-respondent and then uh, whether the survival is short term or long term and in intermediate and so forth. Uh, now let's look at it uh, uh, slightly uh, in from another point of view about what we can do with this image. Uh, so the first example that I was talking about was classification. So given an image, so let's say this is a slice of a CT, can we classify it into whether it is normal or does it have a calcified nodule so this is lung cavity the chest cavity uh, so that is the one kind of task we can make the uh, neural network do so for that we will have to collect uh, two types of image one bucket of image will be normal okay another bucket of image so let's say this has 10,000 images another bucket of 10,000 images would be uh, would be the ones that have uh, nodule 
so this bucketing is important because based on the bucket the ai learns the, to spot patterns that are different between the buckets a uh, more specific training for M, uh, for ai would be to actually point out where the calcified nodule is okay so that is the first one is called classification the second is called object detection okay so it's detecting that object the third slightly more complicated task is to mark all the pixels that have uh, calcification so that is called semantic segmentation and the final one is instance segmentation where you also want to mark them with different colors that this is this is calcification 1 this is calcification 2 okay so these are different kinds of tasks which require a lot of preparation from humans to actually mark the regions right where or or bucket the images uh, so that the ai can be trained on it here are some examples of how we did it for uh, certain problems in pathology uh, with my collaborators at tata memorial and uh, university of illinois chicago uh, this pipeline has three different neural networks you, uh, some complicated tasks require multiple neural networks one neural network basically just detects all the nuclei this is neural network one second one classifies each detected nuclei nucleus into cancer or non cancer cells and then third neural network detects so, so this was breast cancer which one of them are her2 positive and her2 negative right and this is from hnd we can detect her2 positive versus her2 negative cells in breast cancers uh, because we use another modality which is uh, which is the ihc of the uh, adjacent or the serial section to do the annotation to do this task right so this is the these are the results these are all the her2 negative cells these are all the her2 positive cells the red dots versus the blue dots and the green ones are are the ones that are not uh, uh, not uh, cancer cells so this is on hnd we are just showing ihc for comparison it's not that we did it on ihc similarly we can detect uh, braf positive mutation in fact here we did not even use annotation we use a kind of ai that is called weakly supervised learning which can also point out the regions where uh, where the sign of the positivity or the wild type uh, occurs okay, i'll skip some of these so when does ai stop being useful when does ai become uh, inaccurate so here are the reasons when it can become inaccurate when we don't have label data okay when we have too little data or when the labeling and the annotation is of poor quality okay or so this should be obvious right and then uh, data changes during deployment so let's say we trained on uh, data from one kind of an mri machine and at test time we use another kind of mri machine whose uh, which was a different tesla machine or a different uh, had had a different kind of a noise uh, around it okay so if we have that uh, models that are not robustly trained they will not give you high accuracy during test time so these are all challenges with ai ai is not a silver bullet it doesn't adapt very well to changes if we ask it a out of syllabus question so if we just trained ai for uh, for example uh, in breast cancer we trained it for stage staging of cancer right so stage 1 versus stage 2 right but the question that was asked as in the the uh, image that came to us was of dcis on which we never trained okay so then ai will give a wrong answer it is only trained to give you these two answers whereas we are giving it an out of syllabus question if relevant data is not captured you are asking ai to predict whether the patient will respond to a particular drug or not and but that signal for responder versus not responder is not obvious in the images that we captured or the problem is too complicated then ai will not work so there are these are some known issues with ai that ai uh, can have biases that means if it is if we train it on only males for example it may not work very well on females if we train them only on older people it may not work very well on younger people and so forth uh, there are privacy issues in the sense that when we are collecting so much data for ai then we we have to anonymize it we have to store it well etc accuracy we already talked about uh there is opaqueness issue we don't know how ai makes its decisions we know we can only train and test ai but we don't know how, uh, how it uh, makes that decision and false confidence we may rely too much on ai 
so when we are talking about ai uh, there is a life cycle of ai that we need to keep in mind uh, and not just talk about the training and validation of ai right so it starts with identifying the economic need of ai right so basically wh what is the need for a particular ai solution uh, what are we going to solve with that and then how do we make it a very specific problem so that we can use an ai model for that and then comes data preparation so that the the model doesn't have biases it the data represents the the kind of situations in which it will be used then training and validation and then finally when we deploy it we need to uh, constantly test it and uh, after uh, test it and then deploy it and make sure that the user understands what the ai is to be used for we cannot just give the ai to them and say with and let them do whatever with it that's a basically it's a powerful tool which should be used in the context in which it was trained and tested and then finally monitoring and audit that means on an ongoing basis whenever it is deployed in a new scenario or whenever the underlying uh, demographics of the patient population changes we should be able to see how the how it is uh, being used uh, and whether it is uh, whether it is giving the results that we want or not okay. so how can ai help doctors definitely it can help them become more efficient through automation okay and it can also help them through by focusing on the right task so what i mean by that is let's say you come in the morning and you have 1000 cases or let's say 100 cases waiting for you right 100 cases of ct or mri waiting for you so let's say ai rearranges them where the easy cases are are in the beginning before you have your coffee and then in between once you are uh, uh, once you are done with those easy cases it has already marked whether it is normal or what kind of condition it has you just have to quickly look at where the ai is pointing and quickly say yes yes i agree with ai i agree with ai i approve ai decisions and so forth and then it says okay you have had your coffee now let's look at the difficult cases these are the cases that ai found to be ambiguous here you spend more time and then you are done and then you have your lunch and you have post lunch lull so it again gives you easy cases okay where it has already marked things that it has it can confidently identify so it can increase your efficiency through that automation and uh, then it can also give for example second opinions and then you can see whether wherever it is pointing whether you agree with that second opinion or not or whether uh, you need to uh, get into a tumor board and get a, a, a bigger you know opinion of a larger set of experts and it can basically you can think of ai as a test okay so this test several ai engines can be test just like you order a molecular test you might order an ai test on an image that does it look like this is a responder i think this tumor is close to this particular nerve and i cannot operate upon it what does it look like is it critical to operate does it look like from the image pattern is it a responder or a non responder for a particular chemotherapy so it could be another test that you order but you are very specific in asking for that test and the whoever is running the ai for you is very specific in giving you that answer you are not asking the you know a, a, a philosophical or a bigger or a or an unstructured question from ai so it, for specific tests ai can work out so how can doctors help ai so doctors can help in each of these different uh, steps of the ai life cycle they can help formulate the uh, the economic need they can help formulate the question they can help with the data curation and the data labeling and so forth they can help with looking at whether the validation is done or whether it is done over optimistically by ignoring the boundary cases they can help understand where the ai was supposed to be deployed and whether it is being used out of context they can help monitor whether ai is behaving as it should when when the equipment for data collection changes or when the demographic changes so finally with this we should be able to tell what are ai myths so the ai some of the prevalent myths are that ai is very accurate on all problems which is not true ai is not usable on any problem which is also not true the truth is contextual somewhere in between the two depending on the problem for some problems it is closer to being useful for some problems it is not close to being useful and on some problems it does better than humans on some on unstructured problems where you are looking at a lot of information it doesn't do as good as humans uh is it constantly learning on its own no it doesn't learn on its own 
you collect 1 million images, you train one version of V1 of AI and then you deploy it and you see that, okay, after five years, I have increased my collection from 1 million to 3 million images. You train AI again and you release V2 of AI with due testing. It is not constantly improving like we are doing on, on the job. Uh, there, you can set it up to improve, but that's a very dangerous thing to do and no one will do it, at least not for the next 10, 20 years. AI is not a sentient, sentient being. It cannot make moral decisions. It doesn't feel sad. It doesn't feel tired. It doesn't feel ethically obligated and so forth. It's basically a, a, a test. It's a, it's a mathematical test, uh, just like a molecular test. It's nothing more than that. So uh, any responsibility that we have to assign with AI has to be with those who have made the test, those who have done the test and those who have interpreted the results of that test. These are all responsibilities lies with human. And AI is too difficult for, to understand or use. That is also a myth. It's basically just a test. It's a test on a particular image or on a particular medical record or a text or something. It is a test that may not be very explainable. Right? But the result is out anyway. And we can use it as a tool. So these are this is what my message was. Thank you.